Tonight, as we're wrapping up our series on the people of God, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about one specific person from the Old Testament named David. Now, you might be familiar with the story of David and Goliath. This is the same David as is in that story. Um, and that's a really big part of his life, but actually, his life has a lot of other really important things that happen in it. And really, the reason why I want to talk about David's life is the fact that his life ends up looking a lot like the lives of other people that God chooses to work through throughout the entire Old Testament. And there are a lot of things that we can learn about God and about ourselves by looking at David's life. If we wanted to get the total picture of David's life, we'd have to read a few books of the Bible. And so instead of that, I just wanted to give you a few highlights from his life to give you an idea of kind of who he is and some of the major things that happen. So David grew up as a shepherd in Bethlehem. And early on in his life, actually, he is uh, visited by a prophet named Samuel. And Samuel anoints David with wisdom. So Samuel meets David and essentially blesses him and tells him that God wants to give you wisdom. And so at a younger age, as a shepherd, David is anointed with wisdom. A little later on in David's life, uh, he's summoned by King Saul. Now Saul is the king of the Israelites at this time, and Saul wanted to hear music, and David was actually also a musician. He played the lyre, or the harp. And so David is summoned to uh, King Saul to play music for him, and Saul is just overjoyed by the way that David plays. And so this is the first interaction that the two of them have, but actually, David will meet with Saul again later on, and that's where the story of David and Goliath happens. Um, Basically, the Israelites were at war with a group of people called the Philistines. And in those days, there was a tradition where if both of the armies wanted to, instead of having the entire armies fight one another in order to not have as many people die, each army would send out their strongest warrior. The Philistines send out this guy named Goliath. And Goliath is this massive, super muscular warrior. He was one of those guys that from birth was built and bred and trained to be a warrior. And so he's a killing machine. And because of that, nobody from Israel's army wants to go up against him because none of them think that they can kill him. And King Saul is desperate. He's looking for someone, for anyone. And actually, word of this gets to David because David, like I said, he wasn't a warrior. He was actually a shepherd. And so David is tending to his sheep, but he hears about the fact that no one will face off against Goliath. And so David comes and talks to Saul and says, look, I, I think I can do this. I, I can take Goliath down. And they try and put Saul's armor on David, but David, it's too big for him and he can't, uh, he can't carry it. And so David goes out to fight Goliath with nothing more than a few stones and a slingshot. And if you've heard the story, you know that David actually ends up successfully killing Goliath. And because of that, the Israelites uh, are victorious in this war against the Philistines. And King Saul is again so impressed with David that after that he actually appoints David as the commander of his army. And then later on, when King Saul passes away, David becomes the next king of Israel. Now David was anointed with wisdom early on, and so because of this wisdom that he had, he was a great leader in Israel's history. People praised him for the way that he was able to lead people and make good, wise decisions and just overall bring God's people, the Israelites, into prosperity. And he was just a really great leader. People loved him. But David actually had some issues in his personal life. He, one of the most notable ones is that he had an affair with a woman named Bathsheba. And Bathsheba was actually married to Uriah, who was one of David's commanders or officers in his army. And so David has this affair with Bathsheba, and after they sleep together, Bathsheba actually becomes pregnant. And in order to cover this up, David has Uriah killed in battle. And so clearly, this is not an upstanding example of the nicest guy or the greatest guy that you could ever, ever meet or ever hope to see, but God still works through him and does these great things through him. And actually, David realizes that he really messed up in this whole situation of having Uriah killed and having this affair. And he has a really powerful experience with God through that realization. And actually that's something that Micah is going to talk a little bit more about at our Ash Wednesday service next week. So I'll leave that there and let her, let her pick that up a little bit. But later on, David and Bathsheba actually have another son who um, ends up being named Solomon. 
and Solomon will go on to be the king of Israel after David passes away. And Solomon is said to be one of the greatest, wisest kings Israel ever has. So to sum up David's life in just a few words, we could say that David was far from perfect, but God is perfect. So God was still able to work through David to do incredible things. And we've learned over and over, whether it's looking at Adam and Eve or Abraham and Isaac, the fact that one of God's only prerequisites to being able to work through people is that people would be willing to say yes to him. That even if they don't really know what's going to happen, just as we saw with Abraham and when we saw with Isaac, and we see that with David as well, um, just even though they don't know what's going to happen, they say yes, and they say, God, I, I want to follow you. And like I had mentioned, for a lot of David's reign as king, he was seen as an unbelievable king, and he was. He was wise, but God gave him that wisdom. And when David had his eyes fixed on God, and when David wanted to follow God, God was able to do unbelievable things through him. But when David kind of turned away from God and got selfish, when he saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof and decided, you know what, I don't, I don't care that this is wrong, I, I want to do this. When David got selfish and made things about himself, that's when things started to fall apart for him. And Really, that is the story that we see happen over and over again in the Old Testament, whether it is through individual people like David or going all the way back to Adam and Eve. They had the, this exact same problem. When they followed God, when they fixed their eyes on him, they were living in the Garden of Eden and things were beautiful. But then when they realized, you know, there's an opportunity for us to get some personal gain out of this. Maybe we can make this about ourselves. That's when things start to go wrong for them. And so we see this over and over again in the Old Testament. God chooses people, tells them, I want to do great things through you. When they keep their eyes fixed on him and when they're following him, things go well for them. But as humans, we are flawed and we are selfish. And I, I'm selfish. I know that I, if I'm not making a conscious effort to think about others before myself, I'm going to put myself first. And we see that happen over and over again. But God continues to work through people even though this keeps happening. And actually, God continues to promise that actually there's someone else coming. There's another person coming who is going to fulfill my kingdom. There's a person coming that is going to do what Adam and Eve couldn't, what Abraham and Isaac couldn't, and what David couldn't. Even though they all did great things, they weren't able to totally fulfill what it means to live a perfect life. And that's Jesus, and that is why he comes. Jesus comes to live the life that we couldn't live and die the death that he didn't deserve so that we don't have to die that death. And yes, our human bodies still die, but we don't have to suffer the spiritual death because of the fact that Jesus took that on for us. One of the coolest things about looking at the way that God works through people is that he uses special gifts and talents that they have in ways that they would have never imagined. I mean, let's look at the story of David. We talked about the fact that he's a musician. He plays the harp or the lyre. I doubt that David ever thought, man, you know, one day this is gonna mean that I'm gonna get to meet the king of Israel because he's gonna want some music and I'm gonna be the person to provide that. Or the fact that David spent so many years as a shepherd looking over his flock of sheep. And that's where he learned how to use the slingshot that ended up leading to Israel's victory over the Philistines. And even as David is the king of Israel, really looking over Israel and caring for those people, he learned a lot of the ways to care for a group of people through his time caring for his group of sheep. And so God chooses to take these gifts and talents that are unique to each of us and use them in ways that we could never imagine. So as you head off into small groups tonight, I want to just ask you a question that you can think about as you're heading out, and that's this. What might God do in you and through you if you say yes to him? What gifts and talents and abilities and connections might you have that God could use to do things far greater than you could ever imagine?